one piece seamless mold with 5110 platinum silicone. In this tutorial, we're going to show how to make a simple one piece seamless mold of a human skull. And this could be used to create decorative Halloween props or, of course, uh, head armatures. If you're wanting something to sculpt on and start with the human skull shape, this is a great way to reproduce inexpensive foam armature skulls. And we're going to do this with three layers of platinum silicone backed up with a plaster banded shell. So, this is a very inexpensive way to produce a good quality mold that can be used to produce uh, resin copies, either rotationally cast uh, TC-800 if you just wanted to produce hollow white skulls, or you could also use it to cast our rigid casting foam. Our six pound density rigid casting foam is very popular for producing skull armatures, either as Halloween decorations or as sculpting armatures. Now, a one-piece seamless mold is a very attractive concept. Most of you immediately will see the advantage of pulling a part out of this with obviously very little cleanup. Now, the downside is you want to make sure you apply this concept of a one-piece seamless mold to the right kind of pattern. And I'll get into some of the mold theory here in a minute, but first the prep. This is a hard plastic skull that we cast up almost 20 years ago in filled resin, and I've used some protolina gray-green clay to fill in some of the deeper undercuts. Now, quick word about mold theory about an object like this and the kind of objects that will lend themselves to a seamless mold like this. First off, we need to make sure we think of this kind of like a pyramid shape. The shape needs to somewhat taper towards the top. And this is unique in that the base of the skull is, is not as narrow as it might look because it isn't a regular neck. It's kind of an oblong oval shape where it actually meets the workbench. So we're going to need to choose a silicone that has enough stretch that can pull around that low part, the base of the skull, and then roll up and off the top like a sock. But real important, the silicone needs to be soft and stretchy enough in order to do that. Now it's really important before you ever start making a mold that you have a plan of action, a mental plan in your head for how you will construct the mold. So in this case, we're going to uh, plan on making this mold in three layers, a print coat that will be white silicone. Then we're gonna back that up and fill in the undercuts with a thickened, a really thick layer of blue silicone. And then a final layer that will be red of our final layer that's going to simplify that form and smooth everything out on the outside of the mold, resulting in about a quarter inch on average layer of silicone. And then we're gonna build a two piece plaster banded shell and we'll use Vaseline as a separator to keep those two halves from sticking. And of course, once we've made the first half, then we'll make the second half of the mold so it slightly overlaps with the first half. But real important to go through this mental process of planning exactly how you're going to make the mold before you start. This will help with your budget and material usage and make sure you have a clear idea in your head of exactly how the mold will function before you start. Now, first thing we need to do is secure this skull to a baseboard. I'm gonna glue this to a piece of foam core board. And quick word about hot glue. I don't know if it was due to some of the COVID shortages, but some hot glue now, I've noticed some hot glue formulas will inhibit platinum silicone. And in a future video, I'm going to address that and see if I can seek out some specific brands uh, to help you steer clear of that. Now, around that area where the skull meets that baseboard, I'm going to fill in that area with some protolina clay. This is soft protolina clay. This is a sulfur-free utility clay. You can sculpt with this, uh, but it's mainly just a really soft utility clay that's great for filling in undercuts and areas like this. And one of the reasons we want to do this with the clay is to protect against the silicone getting underneath our pattern. Not a big deal because we do have that hot glue there as well, but that just makes that mold peel off that much easier later on. Now, release. Really important when you're making a silicone mold that you use a compatible mold release. Zip 301 is a spray release that does not contain any silicone oil. Silicone oil is of course bad news when you're making silicone molds because silicone oil can act as an adhesion promoter and actually make the silicone in its liquid state stick to your pattern. Or if it's an incompatible silicone oil, it can act to as a cure inhibitor. 
So very, very important to remember to use non-silicone oil release agents. Now we're ready to choose our silicone. Now remember, we want something very soft and stretchy. So quick look at the Shore A scale. And this is from a previous video that I highly recommend you checking out. Uh, you'll see on the low end of the scale, the soft end of the scale, we want something around a Shore A10. So in this case, we'll be picking the 5110. This is a very soft platinum silicone. And not only is it soft, it has a high elongation. So very soft, very high elongation is what we need for a mold that can peel out of those deep undercuts and pull off the top of that skull without ripping. Now quick review of the 5110 platinum silicone properties. Of course the one to one mix ratio makes it very easy to use. This can be thickened as you'll see here in a minute. It's a very soft shore A around a five to an eight. So very soft, skin-like material, stretchy and strong, and it has about a 30-minute working time. So there's more than enough working time to get a good brush-on mold made. And a three to four hour demold. Now, when we're making a brush-on mold, we don't have to wait that full time, but we'll get back to that more in a little bit later. Now, another important part of this process is cheap disposable brushes, which, strangely enough, are available on our web store, which, of course, I'll link in the video description. And we're also going to need some thick sew because we're going to thicken up our 5110 silicone to a brushable paste. Now, 5110 is mixed one to one. And this is a, a process I like to do in one mixing cup. And the reason for that is that really minimizes a lot of waste because when you start transferring materials back and forth between mixing cups, unless you scrape every bit of that out, you could wind up putting yourself off ratio when you're working in really small batches. But most importantly, just makes cleanup a lot easier, just makes the whole process a lot simpler when you mix carefully in one mixing cup. Now remember that that working time starts as soon as those two materials come in contact with each other. Now if you're new to working with silicones like this, it's a good idea to keep a timer handy or keep your eye on a clock just so you keep track of that working time as it goes by because 30 minutes working time if you're working on a large mold can go by quick. Now we're going to put in some silicone pigment and that's just for contrast. Obviously it serves no functional properties but by adding that silicone pigment, we can keep track of where we're putting our silicone on that dark colored resin skull. Now, the other thing we're going to add is obviously the thick so. Naturally, when we mix up the two components, we get a runny liquid. So all of the 51 series silicones, when you mix parts A and B together, you're going to wind up with a pourable silicone. But when you add that Thixo, and the Thixo is compatible with the 5110, the 5130, and the 5140, and the 5150. But when you add in that Thixo, you convert that from a flowing liquid to a brushable paste. And for the first layer, we're just going to add a very small amount, probably less than even 1%. And the reason we're adding such a small amount is we want this to flow a little bit. We just don't want this to just run off and form an expensive puddle. So by adding a very small percentage of thick sew, we wind up with a light paste consistency that flows just enough that we can help maneuver that into those deep undercut areas, and especially those areas around the teeth and the eye sockets. And you can play around with that. That's one of the nice things about a brush on mold like this. You can adjust the thick sew to your liking. In some cases, when you're putting this onto a very simple pattern with not much detail, you might choose to add more thick sew so that it's a very thick paste that you could even trowel onto a surface. And then there might be other times when you're working with a very detailed surface where you don't want any thick sew at all to really let that seep into the detail and capture all of those details details accurately. So again, that can be adjusted to your liking, but just remember, if you don't put any thick sew in on that first coat, you could easily wind up with a very expensive puddle. Here, I think I was mixing up about 300 grams, about 150 grams of part A and 150 grams of part B. And for those curious, all told, this mold took about two and a half pounds of silicone. Now, one of the other things you'll see me doing is I crouch down, make sure I really 
poke that uh, silicone into the eye sockets and the nose. And if need be, you can even use some compressed air to help push that silicone into all of those detailed areas. But again, keep track of time and remember that as soon as that silicone starts getting a little bit grabby, it's time to leave it alone. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you don't have to wait the full demold time. You just need to wait long enough where you can tap your fingernail on that flange and pull it away without removing any silicone. Once you can do that, you're ready to move on. And typically with 5110 at about 75 degrees, that's going to be about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 45 minutes. And again, just remember the ambient temperature will make a big difference in that turnaround time. So again, as soon as you can tap your fingernail without removing any silicone on your fingernail, it can be a little sticky and tacky, but you just want to make sure you're not going to disturb that coat by adding any more silicone. Now this is our second layer, and again, we need another disposable brush. I'm going to use a wider brush for this layer, a two inch brush. And you notice I put in a lot more Thixo on this because with this layer, I'm going to go in and fill in the eye sockets, the nose and around the mouth and simplify that form. So our first layer of silicone, that's typically what we call our print coat. And that print coat is what captures all of that surface detail. Now, the second layer is what helps build the thickness of the mold and give it more strength, but also fill in all those undercut areas. So, as I mentioned earlier, we're going for about a quarter of an inch on average of thickness on our mold. But remember, some of those undercut areas will be a lot thicker than that, and that's okay. This is not an air drying material, so we don't have to worry about really thick areas taking a long time to set up. So again, with this second coat, just remember the main purpose of this is to fill in those deep undercut areas and build up the thickness of the mold. And you'll notice I'm going in here with a popsicle stick once it starts to set up a little bit and smearing that out so I get a nice smooth finish on the outside. And again, after that's set for about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, I can check that with my fingernail. And once that's to a point where I can tap that and not pull up any silicone, we're ready to mix up our second batch. And again, remember that your ambient temperature where you're working will play a big part in how quickly you can put on a new layer of silicone. And if you're working in a really cold environment, it's going to take longer for the silicone to set up to full strength. So really important not to work under 70 degrees. Now our third and final layer is, again, this is probably about uh, 400 grams here with uh, some Thixo added, another disposable brush, and I like to pull some of those loose hairs out of that brush before I start. And as you can see, it also has some silicone pigment in it. And just a reminder that the silicone pigment doesn't have any functional effect other than just helping us track our progress as we build up this brush on mold. Because normally, since 5110 is just a colorless translucent, you can build up a mold just the same with that. But by adding that silicone pigment, we can track those layers and our progress a lot easier. Now what I'm doing here is I'm applying that final layer with a brush and then I'm going to follow up with a popsicle stick and a stir stick to smooth this all out because we want that outside surface to be as smooth as possible so it doesn't grab on the shell and create distortions when we assemble the whole mold for casting. Now again, once I have the silicone spread out all over our form, I'm ready to use a combination of a stir stick and a popsicle stick, and you can even use palette knives to smooth this all out and get the outside as smooth as possible. Now one of the questions I get a lot about molds like this is how many layers does it take to make a good brush on mold? And you don't want to think like that, you want to think more in terms of the overall final thickness of the mold and for it to have the strength required to be a good functioning mold and of course for it to be able to pull inside out over this form we need it to be an average of about a quarter inch to three eighths at the thickest. Now obviously some of the uh, undercut areas are going to be thicker and there might be some thinner spots but that's what we want on average of about a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch. And you can do that on really simple patterns. There's going to be times when you might be able to do that in two coats. On a really detailed part, you might have to use four or five coats with a couple of really thin, runny print coats. So again, real important not to think so much in terms of how many layers, but in overall thickness. Now we're going to allow the silicone to cure completely. 
This is about five or six hours later. And now that has set up enough that uh, we're ready to trim off some of the excess and build our plaster bandage shell. Now the reason I'm going to make a plaster bandage mother mold is twofold. One, this is a very simple mold and we want to make a very inexpensive simple mold. So plaster bandages obviously lend themselves to that, but also that keeps the mold very lightweight. In future tutorials, we're going to cover some more exotic mother mold methods, but those of you making small molds like this, this is a great way to make a tough mold that will last a long time. I have mold Molds in my collection made this way using plaster bandage shells that are over 20 years old and still work great. Now for a plaster bandage shell on a skull mold like this, I typically use about two rolls of six inch plaster bandages. And it's also important to note that these plaster bandages are high grade. That doesn't necessarily mean expensive, but these are high grade medical grade plaster bandages that funny enough, are available on our web store. And I, of course, will put a link in the video description, but not to be confused with hobby store bandage material like rigid wrap. Now, I like to lay these out with, I, you see I have three long strips over there to the right, and then the rest are these shorter bandages that are about eight or nine inches long. And the reason for that, as you'll see here in a minute, is the shorter bandages are what will create the sides of the mold. And those three long bandages, those will become the seam. So actually that's the third seam bandage right there. And we're gonna set those aside. Now to activate the plaster bandages, you'll need a bucket of warm tap water. And in addition to that, we'll also need a release agent. We're going to use the petroleum jelly release. You can also use just regular Vaseline or even some of the Pardol number no. two paste wax. But we wanna make sure that's ready to go and set aside for that purpose. And we're gonna start with a long plaster bandage. And what I'm gonna do with this first bandage, this is only two layers thick, but you'll see that I'm actually gonna fold this twice and that's gonna make this a lot thicker. Once that's fold, folded twice, that makes it four layers and then fold it again. And now it's eight layers thick. So we get a really thick seam bandage. And we're gonna run that lengthwise along the top of the skull and use that to create that dividing point. And that is a very important step. The cleaner that dividing point is, that parting line, the better quality mold we'll have. Now the folded edge that's facing the camera, that is what will actually become the parting line of the mold. So you wanna make sure that folded edge goes right down the center of the piece. If you go too far to one side or the other, you're going to create a mechanical lock or an undercut where those two halves are not going to want to separate. So real important to define that parting line right down the center of the skull. And now you'll see I'm using those shorter bandages to kind of fill in the blanks here. And it only takes three bandages to do those other sides. So uh, starting at the top and working down, put each bandage on. And then I'm taking that last bandage and folding it lengthwise. And that gives me a nice, pretty edge. And that folded edge facing down gives me a nice edge on my mold where I don't have those little frayed plaster bandage ends hanging off the side of my mold. Now, by the time we are done applying those side bandages, that original seam bandage will be just about set up. So what I'm gonna do is take my index finger and press it up against that seam and use it to shape that seam bandage and give it a nice squared off shape. And you see there in that close up, we get that nice squared off shape. I'm just running my thumb and forefinger down that edge to shape that into a nice right angle. And the reason for that is I want that to be as clean as possible. When we make the second half of the mold, I want that to lock into that and create a kind of key shape that runs the perimeter of the mold. So I'm going to take care to make sure everything is nice and smooth around that edge because later on that's all going to have to separate and we don't want any little stringy plaster bits that could cause that to lock. Now once that's set up and these being fast uh, medical grade bandages, that will only take about maybe 10-15 minutes to set up really nice and hard. So we're going to now take some of the petroleum release and rub that all over that seam. 
and extending about an inch, inch and a half away from the seam towards me there. And the reason for that, we want plenty of release on that seam so we don't accidentally lock those two halves of the mold together. Now, your first half of the mold can still be somewhat green and you can still proceed because you're not trying to pry that off yet. You just need it set up enough that you can start working on the second half without disturbing the first half. Now, important to remember that we started with three of those seam bandages. So this is the second seam bandage, which again, I folded lengthwise and then lengthwise again. And that gives us a nice defined edge. And this time, if we've released everything properly, we can take that second seam bandage and really press it right up against that first seam bandage. Because since that's released, we don't have to worry about those two sticking together. And the better you push those together, the, the cleaner that seam is, the better alignment you'll have on your finished mold. So if you wind up with a little bit of a gap there later on, the mold may not seat as nice together and you might have distortions in your casting. Now I'm going to do the same thing on this side, just working from the top down using those three longer bandages. And again, just overlapping those about halfway over each previous bandage. And that gives us a nice strong mold. And then that final bandage at the bottom, I'm going to fold that lengthwise and help define that base around the flange. And again, the whole point of folding those lengthwise is just to give it added strength and then prevent those little stringy plaster bits from getting in our way when we're using the mold. Now the final seam bandage will be applied again to this new side and we're going to do the same thing. Fold it in half and fold it in half again lengthwise to get that nice thick seam. And then that frayed edge we're going to face towards that new side of the mold. And the nice clean folded edge is going to go towards the seam. And we're actually going to overlap so it goes over by... a only needs to overlap by maybe a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch, not much, but just what it's going to do is give you a basically a key that runs the perimeter of the mold. And you'll see that here in a minute once I demold everything. And now it's time for that thousand dollar mold making tip. Clean your hands using the, the bandage water. Do not wash your hands in your sink or you will ruin your plumbing. So there you go. Now, we're ready to demold our bandages, and this is about 35 minutes or so later, but uh, we wait a little bit longer for this typically than we would like a life cast mold because obviously we don't have anyone waiting underneath those plaster bandages. But in about 35 to 40 minutes, you'll have a nice, strong plaster bandage mold. And now the moment of truth, we're ready to peel off our silicone. And you see, because we use that nice, soft, stretchy 5110, that we have no problem with that pulling out of those deep undercut areas without ripping. And there is our finished 5110 platinum silicone mold, ready to turn back around and put into our shell and use for casting. And we have a lot of customers that use this technique for molding simple head busts and skulls and other simple props like this, mainly head busts, because this technique lends itself to easily pulling the part out without cutting a seam. But just remember, you want to be very careful to use this technique on appropriate patterns so you don't wind up trying to stretch your silicone around a really tight, thin neck. And of course, that's really good for using with resin casting where you want minimal cleanup, especially for cold cast bronze pieces, because seams with cold cast bronze pieces are especially tricky. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is a great way to cast rigid foam props. And here we're casting some of our six pound density rigid casting foam. And one of the nice things about that foam formula is it actually has a very slow cream time which allows it to be rotationally cast. So you can actually mix up the foam, pour it into the mold, and slosh it around before it starts to rise. So that makes it a lot easier to get detailed parts like this out uh, without the foam foaming up too fast and creating a lot of voids in the cast. So there you have the process of making a simple one-piece seamless mold with 5110 silicone. And as usual, all of the materials used in our videos are available on our website. You can find all of the silicone and other accessories at brickintheyard.com. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notified when we post new content. And thanks again for watching.